So let me introduce myself. My name is Craig Peters. I'm here to talk about how we make Anna's life easier in a very different way. Uh, one of the things that Flynn asked all of us to do was to think back to when we were new to Kubernetes. And I'm going to have an exercise for all of us, maybe get us moving or talking or at least raising our hands a little bit uh, to, th to think about that. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I work on GitHub Code Spaces, so it's a cloud-based development environments, and um, those cloud-based development environments are meant to make not only Anna's jobs job better, but also release Shadow's jobs better. Basically, anybody who has to interact with code, and more than one bit of code at a time, is uh, a big challenge. Uh, you can find me at Craig L. Peters on GitHub. I'm on all, on all the CNCF and Kubernetes Slack, says Craig L. Peters. Is there this thing called X still? Is it still called Twitter? I don't know. I'm there sometimes, not as much as I used to be. Uh, Mastodon threads, whatever. I like stuff. I like doing things. So if you want to do things, come talk to me about that. So to get to the question, uh, okay. In this room, how many of you have created a new development environment for writing some code, doing builds, running tests, creating a PR, and getting ready to make a PR to Kubernetes or one of the supporting projects in the last five years? How, how many of you have done that new development environment exercise? Okay, how many of you did that for the first time within the last five years and never having done it before? Okay. So a lot of us have done it many, many years ago. Okay, uh, how many readmes do you think it takes to go from, I just got my M1, I mean, I'm lucky I get an M1, because um, I'm a new, relatively new employee. I, I joined GitHub a year and a half ago, and so I got an M1. And uh, how long did it take you to get from an M1 to being able to run tests? Uh, to be able to get your Kubernetes tests to run after you made a change. Uh, let's see. For those of you who it took, um, you know, less than 10 minutes, uh, raise your hand. Okay. How many of you took less than an hour to get your dev environment up and running? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, that's interesting. How many did it take more than a week to get your dev environment up and running? Okay. Nobody. Never? It never got up and running because you do it somewhere else, right? Where do you do it, Caslin? A cloud top. Good call. That's the way to do it, right? You get a VM somewhere that's already doing it. Well, <clears throat> the point is, that's for one dev environment. What if you're, you've got your branch, and you're reviewing somebody else's PRs, and you're working across four different projects that all have different dependencies? And then each of those changes their dependencies. Each of those, uh oh, each of those then has all those kinds of challenges. So essentially what I'm trying to establish here is that we need ways to make this easy for Anna. Because all of us have made it here. We're here because we're contributors. We're trying to build a cadre of people who we can bring up in this community to become new maintainers to can take over co-chair roles, to lead the tech leads in, in these communities so that we can focus on the things we want to be doing, not just making sure that things are inching along as the KEP is getting reviewed, as the PRs are getting hashed over. All right, so what if we could, okay, I want to pick the right window, this one. What if, okay, so this is my fork of Kubernetes in which I have added one little bit of configuration, which we'll look at in a minute, but it allows me to do this kind of speed run thing. Oops, I picked the wrong window. That doesn't help. Ah, I should have put my glasses on. Apologies here, folks. Let's go back here. I'll ah, just forget all that. Let's go here. What if I could just go click on a button in GitHub or code sandbox or using a CLI on my local machine that has Docker desktop installed. 
and I could just trigger something that would automatically set up an environment that has every dependency at exactly the right version, that is pre-configured with all the little bits that are required, every tool for whatever branch, for whatever PR I'm in, it has all of that there. So I'm gonna let that run. The reason I was doing the split screen thing, why do you go to full screen? The reason I was doing the split screen thing is that does take two minutes. Not one minute, not 50 seconds. It takes two minutes because it's a full container environment. And we can take a look at what that is. What it's doing is it's creating for the specific task that I'm trying to work on, it is creating, a, it pulls a virtual machine from a, a pool of machines. It's spinning up a container. You know, it's a, a VM that's running Linux. It spins up a container in the Docker environment there takes the configuration that I added into my repo and runs that and creates an environment that has all of the tools needed to do the full end-to-end -end test, build, test, verify, everything so that I can get a PR in exactly the right shape so that we don't go back and forth, right? And the way it does that is through a declarative configuration that's in the thing called devcontainer.json. DevContainer.json contains all the specifications of what should be in it. It's an extension of Docker and Compose. So it sits on top of, uh, of those definitions. You don't have to have those definitions. You can actually put everything in the dev container itself. Or if you have an existing Docker file, you can wrap it and extend it using this container configuration. And it's an open source spec that GitHub and the Visual Studio Code at Microsoft team uh, brought into the open. It used to be a VS Code specific spec, uh, and we pulled all the VS Code specific stuff out of it, and we open sourced it. And so now that spec has a community around it. Uh, it's building more and more ecosystem support around it. Uh, some of Codespace's competitors and alternatives out there have adopted it. And this is a beautiful, beautiful thing, because what it means is that we're starting to have a common way to express the problems that Anna faces as the application developer, or you face as an infrastructure engineer, or as a network engineer, or whatever your role is, you can work with your colleagues to create this common spec so that we all have at least a common starting point so that I don't have to do builds on my local machine. I don't have to uh, worry about updating my local dependency when one of the projects I work on part-time uh, changes its dependencies. Should turn off the machine stuff. But so what, what we have here, while I was yakking on, is now a machine environment that's fully set. So I can go from that like zero environment on my local machine. I don't have my glasses on make. To, whoops, if I could type. in under two minutes. Applause, applause moment. <laughs> like, I didn't have to know anything. Thank you. I didn't have to do anything special. I, I got this environment. So this is GitHub Codespaces as an implementation, but it works in all these other environments as well. Uh, and what that does for you is it allows you to treat the, the environment in which people do their development as code. And that's really important. And we'll talk about more about the implications of that in a moment here. Go back to the, spe the uh, spec here. Actually, we'll dig into the spec in a second. So let's go take a look at it. Well, it does that work. So the spec itself, it's just a JSON file. And actually, I'm gonna, this particular one is very simple. This one uses a pre-built image. Oh, I should increase the text. Okay, what this does is it's just got a name like any other object, uh, and it specifies an image. In this case, it's an image that I chose to pre-build. This is an important thing. Uh, if you want repeatability, that's very important in this kind of declarative infrastructure space, I'm referencing an image that was built on a schedule or based on a change, based on an event, and published to a container registry. I happen to be publishing it to my own personal one, because this is a fork I created to demonstrate a point. Uh, and that spec 
that actually defines that image. For convenience, I put it in the .github folder because I happen to be using GitHub Actions to build it. it can, anything can build it. Uh, and so the full specification is that I, you know, every time I build a new version of that container image, I build it from the bullseye uh, Debian distribution. And I'm installing a few things in it. I'm installing Go. And here I can declare exactly what version of Go I need. And so this way, what we can do, if this makes sense in the community, is we can align dev container configurations with each branch that has different versions of Go dependencies. And so whenever I go to a branch, I don't have to worry in any way about that. My dev environment on a particular branch will automatically have the right version of Go and any other bits that I need to have. So here, it's a nice feature, like a, it's a, it's a kind of a utility, a helper function in dev containers called features. Dev container features are essentially OCI packaged, pre-configured ways of installing things that are opinionated about how they will work in your development environment. So I have uh, a Docker and Docker feature, SSHD feature, because I may want to SSH, SSH into my environment. Uh, I install Python in it because a whole bunch of the Kubernetes tooling is actually Python. And it installs Kind, etcd, and kubetest. So I've got all of those tools. I didn't have to go read any, you know, readmes about how to get all of that installed. So that's essentially the way that dev container works. Uh, what have we tested in this? Um, I think I'm, I should have switched this with the other slide. I apologize about that. But basically, there's a PR. So some of you all might have been here last year and heard me talk about this. And you're wondering, why isn't it already in Kubernetes? Like, yes, this makes sense. Why isn't it there? The fundamental reason is it's my fault. Uh, I talked about doing it last year for this. Uh, I created this branch that I'm demoing, and uh, I got distracted with work. <laughs> and I'm sure that never happens to any of y'all. So I, had a, I opened a tracking issue. I created my, my uh, fork. I got everything working. And uh, happily, Adam MacArthur from our community uh, noticed that, found my fork, tested it out, and said, somebody should just make a PR. So he made a PR. That's awesome. That's uh, now in... Uh, the KK repo, that PR, and it's under review. And there's a few things for us to talk about about that, which I'll t bring up in the next slide. But importantly, uh, multiple members of the community have tested it. Uh, we've tested Verify, Cube Test, and we've tested it in at least three different environments. One is in Code Spaces, as I just demoed, and since that's my product, it's kind of natural for me to test it there. We've also done extensive testing. Uh, one of the great things about dev containers is they're not specific to any particular location. The open spec also has an open source CLI reference implementation. So there's the dev container CLI, which is actually what I'm using to do the pre-build of the image. Uh, and that CLI allows you, if you have Docker desktop running locally, you can run that container locally and connect to it either SSH or VS Code has uh, an extension called the dev containers extension, which makes it really easy to connect right to that environment. And Code Sandbox is another one that Adam tested uh, extensively, and it works great in there. So what do we need to do next? We need to get that PR merged. Thank you, Adam, for helping work on that. Right now, there's a discussion about how to do that pre-build to make sure we have that repeatable environment and minimize the maintenance cost of that environment. So the approach that I had in my, my branch is to build the dev container image uh, as a part of a repeatable action from scratch from the dev container specification. Another option is to use an existing image and then just layer bits of the dev container configuration around that existing image. And thankfully, the Kubernetes community, I, I actually didn't even think of this. This is, I forget whose idea is, somebody's comment uh, on the PR review. Yay, uh, PR reviews. Uh, suggested that we look at KubeCross. And so I've now tested it. I, we can take a look at that. I have another branch that's got KubeCross and I've done preliminary testing with that and it works great. What that would do is that means that since we have to maintain the versions of all the things in KubeCross anyway, that would reduce the, the maintenance uh, load every time something gets versioned for a given branch. So we can depend on KubeCross and just wrap a dev container configuration around that. I'm sure there are other questions, so please 
take a, a look at this PR and add your comments as well. Once we get that landed, then uh, we want to update the new contributor guide because right now the new contributor guide says, go try these things and says, well, you might want to do it in code spaces. Well, it'd be awesome if it just has a link that says, boom, and does exactly what I did in my demo. It just spins up an environment and you can go as a new contributor, just go try it out and uh, make your first PR. Uh, the next is in the development guide. Uh, there are a bunch of references to how you go about setting up your local environment. Well, you can say you can either use this de you know, defined uh, spec as de a declarative environment for the environment or do all these steps uh, on your local machine or in your VM, wherever you're doing that. Uh, and then end-to-end -end testing has a bunch of references also to how you configure your environment. And I bet there are others as well. So I, I'm going to convert some of this into uh, PR comments. And, uh, and then I plan to do a blog, you know, to popularize, to help people know that this thing exists. It'll be in the configuration. And so in GitHub, you'll see it. And other people can also blog about it and point to how you do it with Code Sandbox or Dev2 or any of the other tools that support it. Uh, and then we want to track feedback. And so what I want to do now is I want to ask what other things we should be doing. How should we be making Anna's job better? Actually, one other comment I have about the way all of this works is, I don't know about y'all, but whenever I take a break from a project and then I come back to a project, it takes me you know, hours, hours to get my environment back to where it needs to be. Right? And that switching cost is a huge impediment to me actually going and working on that project. Like that's probably one of the reasons that I avoided making the PR for KK in the first place, right? Is that I had a whole bunch of other work to do and then the cost of coming back and figuring out if I had everything right was too high. And so if we can reduce that cost for all of us, the time savings, the, the contextual cost, uh, switching cost problem should really be reduced and we should be able to collaborate a lot better. That's really my whole point. But what I want to do is invite, invite y'all if you have any ideas, any questions, comments, feedback. Uh, now's the time for that. Any questions, comments, or feedback about dev containers? Is it a bad idea? No? Okay. I know I'm terrible at dev environments, so. Uh. Kevin, uh, Kevin's Kevin is bringing you a yeah. mic. Is there any capability to, like, say you're you're building a Helm chart or something that needs a Kubernetes to test against? Is there any capabilities to be able to pass it credentials or something in order to? Yes. Absolutely. So uh, dev containers have the notion of secrets. Uh, and every implementer of the dev containers has their own mapping of how you get those secrets into the dev container. So fundamentally, they just get, like any other thing, they get represented as an environment variable. Uh, and so, for example, GitHub Code Spaces has repo level secrets, user level secrets, organization level secrets. And all of those at the time of the creation of the environment get realized as those environment variables. So you can leverage those secrets. We recently added into the spec um, something called suggested secrets or required secrets. And so those are things like um, the use case where like, say I'm spinning up an environment and I need my open API key, for example, right? And at the time of creating the environment, we'll say, hey, paste your open API key into this field, and that then gets, at least in the GitHub represent, uh, implementation of it, gets stored as a repo level secret that's specific to you as a user. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Any other questions? But it is really cool. I can just run kind in this environment and it works great. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all very much.